today. I hope you are ready for school to begin. All right, guys? Yeah. Woo, school, let it happen. All right, your parents are ready. Well, I'm grateful you're here. I don't know if you picked up your worship card on the way in, but if you didn't, we've got some out in the hall and our greeters can get those to you. If you're our guest with us here today in person, welcome. If you're joining us on the stream, we're grateful you are here and uh, we're excited to be able to worship today. I want to have a special time of prayer this morning as we get started for our, uh, for our school start back. I know some of you are homeschooled, some of you are private school, some of you public school. Any way you school, uh, I want to just pray for you, pray for your parents, uh, pray for your teachers, and just ask the Lord for a blessing in that. Uh, look, a lot of things going on as we get ready to kind of crank up. This week, we don't have Wednesday. Uh, if you get the Church Center app, there's some connections here where you can scan in and get that app if you're not plugged into that yet. Um, but uh, on the 23rd, we'll crank up with our Wednesday night regular schedule. So that's not this Wednesday, but it's the following Wednesday. I also want to say for the end of October, I know some of you are last minute kind of people. And you are thinking for the marriage weekend that you're just going to wait and wait and wait. People are already kind of jumping in on that, and so if you're going to jump in on the marriage weekend, you need to jump in on it. Now, here's what happens. Most guys are like, oh, you know what, we're probably going to have to hold hands with other dudes at some point, and it's going to be touchy-feely, and he's probably going to ask us to express our emotions to one another, and we're going to have all kinds of awkward emotional times and I just don't know if I want to do that guys listen I lead this thing it's not going to be overly emotional so why don't you lead your marriage plug into this it takes 50 bucks to reserve your spot and get in we've got room for 40 couples once we hit that we are that's it all right first year we did this we had 13 couples last year we had 27 couples and this year we're planned for 40 and we got the space maxed out that's all we can take so just telling you go ahead and get plugged in i think it matters it will matter for your marriage and it will help your family and so i hope that you will do that all right let's stand let's open with some prayer in our worship time we we'll to remind you nine o'clock every sunday morning we're gathering in here for prayer. It's, uh, it's private prayer, and we do a little bit of public prayer, and so I hope that you will, uh, you'll participate with that next Sunday, but that's every Sunday we do that, all right? So we've already prayed over this house, and we've already asked God to do uh, uh, an important thing, and you know what? Some of you are in a really important spot today, and I hope you came ready to be impacted by the Lord, because He has a word for you. Let's pray. Let's ask Him to move. Our Father, we thank You for Your grace. For the mercy of Christ that gives us this time, Lord, allows us to walk with you and be near to you. Lord, we thank you that you are our audience today. We sing these songs to you and for you. Lord, as we uh, turn our attention to school, to the new semester, Lord, we've got some students entering a really critical time. Times when they're faith will be tested in times when their future, future will be determined. And I lift up our students and I ask, Lord, that you would call them to be a faithful generation. That they would know Christ and that they would make you known among their classmates. Lord, I lift up our teachers who are on the front lines and our admin who are supporting our teachers. And Lord, we ask for your blessings on them and for your help for them. And Lord, that these days in this class uh, this set of classes would be an opportunity for them to share that grace of God that you have given to us. Give them strength for that challenge. Lord, for those parents who are about to send their kids or teach their kids at home, Lord, I ask that you would give them your wisdom and your strength and your power to do this work. There are such frustrating days. And yet, Lord, you have called us to this task not just to educate our children, but to train them to know Jesus. Make us effective in building a heritage of faith. 
Lord, we're here today. We're looking for your presence. Be welcome among us. Be our audience. Take, Lord, that seed of honor and hear your people as we sing these songs to you. Be glorified and honored. Lord, we seek to do that this morning. If you'll inhabit this house, we will be blessed. So now we sing to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Let's worship together this morning.
darkness tries to roll over my bones And it slow comes to steal the joy out In brokenness and pain All I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in. Roughly around the year 1000 B.C., King David was on the throne, and he asked God, God, I want to build a temple for you, and God told him, you're not going to build it, it's going to be your son. So David was, okay, I'll make preparations for it. So he asked all the people, bring whatever you have for this purpose. And they brought great and great amounts of gold, silver, bronze, and many other things. They gave sacrificially way more than just the 10% or something like that. So they gave a lot with joy. And then David had this prayer. And in this prayer, I want you to focus on two things. One, this magnificent description of God in royal terms. And two, how David sees himself and everything they gave in comparison to what God has given them, okay? Focus on that. First Chronicles 29. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power, and the glory and the majesty and the splendor 
for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. Now, O our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. And listen to this. But who am I? Who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are aliens and strangers in your sight, as were all our forefathers. Our days on earth are like shadow without hope. O oh Lord our God, as for all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name, it comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things have I given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. O Lord our God, of our fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep this desire in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. Thank you, Father. When we sing, we can only sing because you gave us breath in our lungs to sing. When we raise our hands, you gave us our bodies to raise our hands. When we tithe, when we give some money or time, we only can give this because you have, you have given this to us. Thank you, God, for the abundance of your blessing on us and help us to recognize that everything we have is yours. Help us to be joyful in everything we do for you. In the name of Jesus, amen.
and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored, and the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of all shall not.
hope we have in Jesus, the certainty of salvation, the coming day before your throne, where our faith is made sight, Lord, for the incredible saving work that you've done on the cross and for our sins and in the grave, and to be resurrected for the completion of that work. And Lord, for this, we trust you. Lord, we trust you today. Um, for this life, in this moment. Lord, as we turn our attention to Your Word, as we continue in our worship, Lord, we want to continue to respond to You. Lord, give us that grace and that peace. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So some of you might have noticed that we're talking about parenting. I'll say that again. You don't seem to be as intimidated as you should be. We're talking about parenting. Oh, go ahead. I didn't know which, I, I don't know. You just responded according to my excitement. Some of you are thinking, well, good, I can check out for the next few weeks because I don't have kids at home. Some of you are thinking, I'm, never, I, I'm just a kid. Uh, like, what do my parents know? I hope they listen up. I'll take some notes for them. That might be where you're at. Others of you are a little bit dreading this because you're worried that you're going to find out you did it all wrong. I want you to know something this morning. This is a no judgment, but God's judgment kind of thing. The best time to make a change and the call of God to make a change is in that moment when you hear His voice to soften one's heart and to return, to move toward the Lord. It's always opportune. This is not, as we talk through, it's not so much about parenting as it is about heritage. And every one of us desires a heritage of godliness in the broader society and in our home. Some of you grandparents, wouldn't you be grateful if your kids disciplined your grandkids so that when they came for turkey, they didn't throw it all over the floor? Wouldn't you be grateful for that? So maybe you'll get some ammo to hand off to your kids. This is not so much going to be about the do's and don'ts of parenting. It's going to be about a doctrine that God has given to His people. The doctrine of heritage. The way that He's called us to respond to Him in this fundamental task. But here's the reality. Every one of us individually needed to come to that place where we trusted Christ and our parents could not do it for us. So at the most, what we can accomplish in our heritage building is to point 
our children to a real Jesus, whether those are biologically our children or whether those are our kids at church, I'd love to see a stack of teenagers sitting right here. Good to see you guys. Welcome to student ministry. All of you newbies jumping in. Big bunch of kiddos. If you walk down the kids' hall, we've got a big bunch of kiddos. And so today, and as we move through these next series of passages in the coming weeks, this is about aiding, this is about modeling, this is about mentoring a generation. You know, God works in really young lives. And we want to be the kind of church that sees that heritage potential and then acts in a way to see them grow. And so that's what we're pursuing. Not judgment, not about how you did it right, how you did it wrong. We're not concerned about that. We're concerned about hearing God today and setting a trajectory. So I, I was driving about. There's not much plant life. But it reminded me that uh, if you want to grow plants, it's really fundamentally about chemistry. You need to know some chemistry. Mixture of water, minerals, certain whatever else goes into planting plants. But it's pretty much chemistry. You're going to get the kind of plant that you planted, right? I mean, maybe you get something different, but for the most part, I think you get the kind of plant that you planted every time. Plants require chemistry. Dogs, they require persistence. It doesn't matter what kind of breed of dog you have, you're going to have to persist. It can be a dumb dog, it can be a smart dog, but you're going to have to persist. And if you persist enough, you will get a halfway manageable canine. Maybe even a friend. I want you to know something, you dog owners like me. Your dogs have exactly the emotions you give them. Meaning they're not feeling anything. They're just wondering if they're going to eat. But if you think they're friends with you, then they're friends with you. It's good. Dogs are simple. Simple emotions. Persistence is what it takes. The smarter an animal gets the more stubborn an animal gets. Did you know this? So like pigs are super smart, and they're super stubborn. Our neighbors have a pet pig, a house pig. He doesn't do anything he's told to do. Because he's smarter than the dogs. The dogs follow him around. If you're raising children... You need more than chemistry, more than persistence. You need wisdom. And wisdom only comes from Christ. It only comes down from God. The Scripture is very clear in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1 through 7 about this. And the problem for us, when we are dealing with heritage and the next generation, when we want to build a heritage, is we need wisdom at a time when we're often too young to have that wisdom. You notice that the Lord gives us children when we're physically capable of keeping up with them, but not smart enough in life to do anything with keeping up with them. So we lack wisdom, but we have energy. And when we get older, we lack energy, but we have wisdom. God has constructed us so we get this time where we need to take these, uh, these moldable children and we need to make them into productive, Christ-honoring adults. And the question is, how do we do that? Well, first, it begins with us understanding where a kid starts in this journey. If you were to take your text and turn to Genesis 3.15, I want to show you something very important about your kids. You might already know this, but it bears repeating. That the problem with your kids is first and foremost that they're sinful. When Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, their eyes were opened, they realized they were naked, and they hid from God. In verse 8, chapter 3, verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. In 3.15, you begin to see the problem. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. 
He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There's this ongoing conflict between the evil in our world and the evil within our soul. You could be alone on a desert island in the middle of any ocean in the world and you would still be evil and you would still have evil children. Some of us erroneously think that our kids are really pretty good until they're not pretty good. And that they just learned it from the buddy down the road or from their sister. Your kids knew it from the womb. And as soon as they had the power to carry out evil, they were compelled by evil. Is this a low view of children? By the way, children are smarter than us. They don't have as much information as us, but their little brains grab and hold information far more quickly than their parents. And remember, the smarter an animal gets, the more stubborn they become. You know what the smartest animal on the planet is? It's your little 18-month-old child. Smartest animal on the planet. I looked in the eyes of my 18-year-old child that was smiling at me, and this 18-year-old child, 18-month-old child, what did I say? Year. <laughs> that too. 18-month-old child. And I looked in their eyes, and they didn't have many words, and I said, now, child, you understand when I'm telling you that you're not supposed to do that? And he looked up at me, smiled, and nodded. And I had this weird sense in my head. It's a parenting sixth sense. I had this sense that this kid was simply telling me what he knew I wanted to hear in the moment so he could go right back to doing the thing I was correcting him about and he would avoid being in trouble then. And I found out my little 18-month-old, he knew a lot more than he was letting on, and I realized that I was already behind in the parenting game, that my kid was already on top of it and was already playing me. Some of you are saying, it's not my child. My child is, my child didn't get bad till they went to school, honestly. Right, it's those other kids that influenced my child. I got news for you. We all were dead in our trespasses and sins and in the hardness of our own hearts. So it begs the question, what is it that we're doing in this world? What are we trying to accomplish? Well, this contest of identity begins then in Genesis 3.15 as people have been attempting to hide from God. But in Genesis 1.26, we get the definition of who we are as children. Notice this text so you don't have to flip back and forth. And God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air. And so they, as man and as woman, were created in the image of God. Ephesians 6, 4 follows up this idea. Notice what he says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord the whole context for parenting is a battle of identities on the one hand our children were intentionally created to bring glory to God to represent his glory on this planet they were to be reflectors of the glory and goodness and person of God and us as parents and us as grandparents in us as interested individuals in the lives of kids and growing people. Listen, we were all supposed to express the image of God, but we fell to sin. And now, instead of asking God, God, who are you as our life pursuits? We ask God, who am I as our life pursuits? You see, the sin in the garden was fundamental, and the sin in our hearts is fundamental. Our children, the reality is they need to become more like Christ, not more like us. 
there are some things that my children inherited in character and quality. They did things that I never want, I didn't want them to struggle in some of the ways I struggled. And I noticed as my kids got older that they struggled in those character qualities exactly in the same way. They just got them implicitly from me. And because they were raised by sinful parents, you know what? It exacerbates their problems as sinful kids. So what is it? Today, what I want us to talk about is what the biblical goal for our parenting should be. Our parenting, our goal is to raise adult followers of Jesus. You can take your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. We're going to be in a few different places. Now, I want to remind you, there is a difference between an expositional sermon, uh, which is what we normally do, and a more doctrinal sermon, which is what this is. And the biggest indicator is simply this. Usually we get in a passage and we camp there. We talk about that passage. This morning already we've been in a few different passages because we're talking about a doctrine of heritage building. And so we're going to be throughout our Bibles. We'll have most of those passages on the screen behind me. Um, hang with me. You can turn there and I... Uh, advise that you do that but they'll at least be on the screen so if you're not real nimble in your bibles then uh then you won't get behind okay will you stand with me as we read this all-important passage out of deuteronomy 6 beginning in verse 4 we're going to read down to verse 9 this is called the shema it is one of the chief verses in jewish law in the old testament it represents everything that Israel as a nation was supposed to know, it is still applicable to us and still the, uh, the charge that God has given us for the way we raise a godly heritage. I want you to read it with me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Lord, I ask that you would give us wisdom in your word, and wisdom in this area of building heritage. Guide us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God's heritage, what we find in our passage here, God's heritage imparts His morality and His mission to us. Two things, not just one thing. Remember, for us to be adult followers of Christ, and for us to pass down a heritage of being adult followers of Christ, we're going to have to install something other than a partial image of the world and a partial image image of God we need our kids to be about the business of God his mission and to have the character of God the problem is most of us even if we're in church we don't know our own mission and what we should be doing in regards to Christ and our kids grow up seeing us living out a life that is segmented and disjointed on the one hand we have a a moral standard of the house But on the other hand, we seem to be serving ourselves. God's heritage is non-native to us. I saw this video last week, and it was a video of a a dolphin rescuing a dog. A dolphin rescuing a dog. I did a little research, by the way, on this video. You might have seen it going around. A dog supposedly fell into the ocean, and this dolphin randomly comes along, scoops up the dog, takes him back to the boat, that was a flipper episode did y'all know that it was passed off as news it was a flipper episode dolphins don't save dogs and you know what godless parents godless parents don't pass down a godly heritage here's the beautiful grace and redemption of jesus though 
that God starts new with each of us. Parenting toward Christ is non-native. It's not something you just know how to do. Picking up God's character and God's mission is not something you just show up and can accomplish. You yourself have to decide where your identity and where your mission comes from. You yourself have to decide that this God is your God. You see, I think what kids want to see more than anything and what a heritage of godliness is all about is that when our kids see a church that's for real, when they see people that truly elevate Christ and who He is, when they see a congregation dealing with sin, when they see their parents at home wrestling with sin, then they begin to see that God is real in the lives of the people they love. And that, that is the core of Deuteronomy 6.4. Notice how it starts. It starts with this huge theological statement. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, or the, one, the Lord is one Lord. The whole idea is God's oneness. He is the Trinitarian God of the Bible. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is here. He's expressed his, his self to people on purpose to redeem us. It is this God who has come to save us. I want you to see verse 10. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that He swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you with great and good cities and all these things, and your kids come and ask you about that story. He says, in those days you shall tell them. Verse 20, when your son asks you in times to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? What do you say? We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders and great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us into this land. In other words, you tell the story of what God did in your life. That God was real and functioning in your life. And you create the testimony of transformation and heritage for your kids. This also means that since God is the lawgiver for us, that His standard is greater than all of us. You know, we're all on this journey together. And with your kids, you're on this journey together. If at some point in our life we say, listen, you're going to do what I tell you, and you're going to do it or else. You know, kids are like uh, hypocrisy thermometers. If ever you commit the parenting foul of saying but not doing, your kids We'll both know it and probably will tell you about it. It'll make you really angry. But let's look at it a little more subtle. If you say, listen, we go to church. That's what we do on Sunday. We go to church. Your kids will learn that on Sunday you go to church. They will not necessarily learn that you go to worship the God of heaven because you go to church. They'll learn that you do a thing but not why you do a thing. Guys, I want to tell you something. If you stand there just staring at the words on the screen as the music is going, and you're like, I'm not singing, that's not what guys do. You know what? You're going to raise generations of kids, and especially young men that say, I'm not singing, that's just not what guys do. And yet, there's a big portion of the Scripture that's all songs. It's called the Book of Psalms. All about singing the greatness and the glories and the work of God. Our kids watch us, they see us, and they see whether we are mutually submissive to God or not. You see, we're ambassadors of God, not just captains in our home. It's not just about telling our kids what to do, because we're fighting actions, yes, but what about attitudes and appetites of the soul? I think parenting has one 
opportunity. We can physically control the actions of our kids while they're little. But eventually they outgrow us. Our kids outgrew Tracy when they were like fourth grade. They eventually outgrow us, and so our threats and our physical presence no longer matters to the sense of them submitting to God. We can affect their actions, but what will we do about attitudes and appetites that are off base and against God? How will we conform those? You see, here's the beautiful thing about our God. You are called to deal with the actions to help your kids know how to behave in private and in public. You're called to invest in them and give your life for them and love them. But you're never called to cause their attitudes to do something that only God can do and that only God will do. Think about your own journey and where you're at. Do you not have attitudes and appetites? I mean, some of us have actions that are controlling our life. What about those attitudes and those appetites that are in charge of our life? We need God to work in us. I want you to see Psalm 127, 3 through 5. I want you to see what is expressed here. It says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. Here's the beautiful passage. And it took me a long time to understand this. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks. There's some better translations. When he contends with his enemies in the gates. When he contends with his enemies in the city gates. Variously translated. I had a hard time understanding this passage for a long time because I thought, why would we want our kids to contend with us when our enemies were around? But that's not at all what it's talking about. It's talking about raising adult followers of Christ so that our kids are on the same mission with us. That is, they are useful partners in the work that we have to do in this life. Now, some of you have got really little children, and they don't help at all. They hinder your life. You would just love for somebody to take them for a little while so you could get a shower. Ladies, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Somebody watch these kids so I can get a warm shower without being concerned that the house is on fire when I get out of the shower. I would, my dad would take us along to work with him from time to time. And my, my older brother finally asked him, he was like, Dad, we hate going with you to work. Why do you take us? And uh, this is a dangerous question if you don't want the truth. My dad said, you know what, you're no help to me when you come with me. But I want you to learn something, and this is a chance I have to spend some time with you. Talk about feeling like a jerk. We see in this passage in Psalm 127, that same vision for the future. You're guiding your kids to follow Christ through the distractions and the deceptions of this life. You're guiding your kids while you're discouraged, while you feel like you're not doing it right, while you feel like you're messing up every step, while you feel like you're not the mom or the dad that you need to be. You're guiding them while the world is telling you all these different things about how to parent your kid and what to do. Anybody worried about the deceptions out there? Listen, any kid with a phone has a portal to deception in their pocket. And the deceptions seem to grow in their allure throughout life. And many of us are living a duplicitous life. We're concerned with being able to get them the character they need. But the question is, do you have a mission in your home? And it's a mission that's greater than being or becoming. We're not so concerned with self-esteem as we're concerned with self-sacrifice. You know, American kids 
have some of the lowest test scores in the developed world, but some of the highest self-esteem in the developed world? Like our kids feel really good about themselves and don't perform very well on their grades. We're doing a great job with self-esteem. Our kids believe more in themselves than they ever have believed in themselves. And yet at the same time, increasingly they're having difficulty bridging the gap between late high school and college and early young adulthood. Listen, that's a tough time no matter how you slice it. It's difficult to be in that time, but parents, I'm telling you the goal is to help your kids jump the gap. And it's helpless as a parent to watch them walk through those phases to know that they don't have a clue what they want to do or where they want to go. And I'm telling you, for us as believers, as followers of Jesus, we've got to help them tie to Jesus. At some point, you want your kids on your team helping in the gospel mission of Christ, wherever they are. That's the biblical vision for heritage it's why we have to have healthy churches that deal with sin and deal with life where we are fully committed followers of jesus that's why it's important for us and every one of us to be engaged in who god is and what god is doing not just his character but also his mission see god's heritage creates stewards, not saviors. I have a friend, his name is Phil. Phil lives in uh, the Philippines, does a great work over there, a great gospel work. One day, lives out on the tribal island, so he's really remote with his family. And one day a typhoon came in. He's a South African guy. And uh, a typhoon came through, they don't get a lot of notice of typhoons, uh, limited weather services, li- limited internet, limited power, uh, mostly not running water. I mean, it's pretty legit on the edge of uh, civilization. And they had a typhoon come through. Uh, by the way, that's like a hurricane spinning the opposite direction. So it came through and it washed over their village, knocked out all the power dead of night, blasting rain, it was pitch dark. He didn't know where his family was. They were all, he supposed, still in the house. But he started hearing the roof panels, the corrugated roof panels, get picked off of the top of his house. So he jumps up on his roof in the typhoon from the inside of the house, and he lays himself across three of the panels that he can reach. And he rides out the typhoon holding down the corrugated panels. When the typhoon was over, there were exactly three corrugated panels still on the house. His family was intact in there, but for a couple hours they could not hear or see. They didn't know where each other was. They were doing the only thing that they could do, which is just set tight. Now, which of you as parents are going to stop the typhoon from making landfall? You see, you cannot be a savior for your house. There is only one savior. And he saves the souls of individuals. If you want to be the savior, here's what you have to contend with. Romans 3, 10 speaks to us a little bit about the condition of the heart. In 3.10 he says, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. If you want to be a Savior, somehow you would have to access spiritual salvation for your kids your priority number one is that they know jesus church our priority is that our kids know jesus that there is a heritage of faith genuine true faith and that faith does not primarily come because they're in children's or student programs 
It comes because they encounter real and legitimate followers of Jesus. Every time we tell a story of someone's salvation, every time we celebrate that someone has moved from death to life, we are emphasizing and telling the story of what God has done in His great work. You're in this fight where the identity is corrupted, where our roles in our homes are, con- uh, are corrupted, and where it is a clash for control in our homes. Stewards take a little bit different apo- approach. 1 John 3 2 talks a little bit about these stewards. It says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. You see, stewards are not saving. Stewards are accompanying Stewards pick you up when you've fallen down. They don't necessarily protect you from falling. When we raise adult followers of Christ, wherever you are on that journey, at whatever angle you take that journey with others, to to steward is to disciple, to treat others and cause others and focus others on being followers of Jesus. Our heritage then, our heritage is to be adult followers of Jesus Christ. God knows where He's taking you, and He knows where He's taking the kids. And that's a beautiful hope for us. Because you can get a lot of things wrong. It's possible that you have not prioritized Christ in your home, meaning, here's what it means, it means that you have not allowed Christ to be transformative in your life. You know what's important? Not that you always have done it, but that today, you do it. It'd be nice, wouldn't it? It'd be nice if when somebody asked us how our kids were doing, we could tell them the whole truth of how they're doing. But most of us say, they're fine, they're fine, you know, they're fine. They're, they're busy, they're in sports, and they're in band, and they're, they're all of these things, right? All the stuff that they're going they might be busy to death. You know, school's starting up. I know band started in uh, May before the last year was out and pretty much has just been going since then from the reports I get. Your kids are busy. they got a lot to do. But my question is this. If you want to steward their soul, what is your approach? What will you do? You can't touch their attitude and their appetite. You can correct them in practical ways, but you need a partnership with God and God who does the heavy lifting. The Holy Spirit has to infuse in your home and He has to change you first. We've said this before, but I think we need to say it again. Fake faith is worse than no faith. And our kids' hypocrisy meters, they tell the story. And if, Dad, if you are convicted of sin in your life, if you've flown off the handle or you've done things that have dishonored the Lord, and you say to your kid, you say, listen, I messed that up. I'm sorry. That is not the standard of God. The standard of God is this. And what you did was wrong too. But together we have to repent before God. You know what? That is powerful. Not that you don't sin but that you do see where God is going and what Christ is doing in your life. Listen, you could be a grandparent and all your kids are out of the house and you have limited conversation and connection with them and you're saying, well, what's the incentive for me? What do I need to do? I didn't do it right. I'd love to have another chance at it. So you know when you play a video game and you die... You can just start over, right? You respawn. You don't get a respawn in this life, and you don't get a do-over. But the beautiful thing is that the Lord can continue to use you, 
and a testimony of transformation today, of renewed devotion, of beginning devotion, is powerful in other people's lives. Heritage building means we are stewards of God's character and God's mission. You know, we, we send rockets into orbit, and I always see those, those pictures of the control room. In fact, I was in Houston one time, and I got to go in there, really Webster, League City area. I got to go in the control room, and uh, this was the 90s, so desktop PCs were just coming in. We still had the clunky old monitors. It wasn't rad at all. But you look at it, and there's all these guys and gals. I mean, they're all stacked up there in mission control. And you've got kind of a viewing booth where you can see things. And they're all, I don't know what, all the, I guess they're all geeks. All the geeks are in there. And they are mission control. And all they're doing is sending up data to the astronauts because they're not astronauts. They're not in space. They're not on the shuttle at the time, the shuttle. They're not in the cabin. They're not experiencing weightlessness. They are going to clock out pretty soon and go home while the astronauts continue to make their flight. Folks, there's coming a day. You hit the blast off button and the control is gone. And our kids will do and will behave and will be their own people. Our heritage then is to raise adult followers of Jesus Christ. This is a pregnant phrase. We raise adults. You don't want permanent kids. We raise adults. And we raise those adults to accomplish one purpose. Not to be pro ball players. Not to be terrific musicians. All those things might be the case for them. And praise the Lord if they are. But that's one aspect of life. It's not the whole of life. I don't care what your kids do. I'm concerned with the faith that your kids have. And listen, you've got to walk them to the place where you will take the mission control seat and they'll take their own and fly their own mission. You want to know that they have a clear compass and a right direction and you want to know that they're anchored to the same standard that you were anchored to. You see, the big payoff for being a parent is when we can say to our kids, I have followed Jesus and I want you to follow Jesus. Zero parents have saved their children. Zero have saved them. So there are some things that you can do. First, elevate the Bible as the common standard for your home. This means that all submit to it, and so everybody knows it. Uh, this may be a surprise to you when we were raising our kids. We did not have a committed devotional time. In other words, it wasn't every night or every morning at a certain time. They had Bible classes as we homeschooled. They had different things. But from the earliest that my kids could toddle and, and even before that because they could smell when I was awake and so they would just wake up whenever that was. And they loved to yell in their room and wake their siblings up. So I'd have a kid or two sitting in my lap as I read devotionally. And they saw it from the earliest days, from the times when they were crinkling the paper or ripping pages out of my Bible, or whatever they might have been doing, they saw that. They experienced it. They saw it in their mom. They saw that this mattered to us. We would talk about the Bible over our mealtime. And I know some of you are like, well, you're a pastor. You're supposed to do that. You went to seminary. You've got the knowledge. I wouldn't know where to begin. That's a nice excuse, but listen, the Bible comes in your language. I know that for a fact. So just begin. Just begin. Don't get technical. Don't worry about it. Where do you start reading any book? Well, just start in the beginning and start working your way through. I mean, that's, that's most of the reason we're here is to help you walk with Jesus. So elevate the Bible as the common standard for the home. You may not know anything, but you know enough to say, listen, 
we've been going a wrong direction, and I'm going to take us a different direction. I want us to follow Christ. Now, listen, this doesn't mean you say, so I'm going to get baptized, and all you kids are going to get baptized, whether, whether you believe in Jesus or not, we're just going to do it, because that as a family is what we're going to do. No, that's not as a family what you need to do. You're saying, my heart is going to be with the Lord. And that's the direction I'm going. And you invite them to join that journey. Remember, we want adults who follow Jesus, not just kids who follow us into the church house. So elevate the Bible as the common standard for your home. If you have not done this, you know a good place to start? It's always the starting place. It's repentance and confession. Is it okay to tell your children that you messed up? Even if they're adult children? Is it okay to say, I got it wrong? You know what confession is for believers? Confession is not to expose our shame to all the world. Confession is a statement of victory. Confession is the gateway, the open door to a new life. We begin with confession. Listen, if you want a restored relationship with somebody, you know what it's going to take? It's going to take confession. They got to know they did you wrong. You got to say you did wrong to them, whatever it is. If your relationship, your spouse, your married relationship is kind of broken right now, then you're probably going to have to go through a bit of confession because confession says, I did wrong, I can't change that, but Jesus can heal us. Confession is the beginning of victory, and so you just start there. You say, listen, I didn't raise the right standard for our home. Church, you know, we have to do this when we've been unhealthy as a church and not a great family following Jesus. Sometimes we have to say, you know, we hadn't been there and we hadn't done that, but we're going to. And it's time for us to confess and move on. We're going to elevate the standard of God. Second, you need to know your mission as a family. You're like, well, dang, I don't know what that is. I know where I'm going for lunch. But that was tough to figure out. I, the mission of God. When you say, listen, here's the standard for our home. We're going to talk scripturally to one another. And we're going to learn it because we don't know anything. And you say, and we're going to follow Jesus. That is a mission, okay? That's movement. It's called pointing when you're not moving. It's called direction when you're moving. You just need to move. You say, we're going to follow Jesus. Here's the question for your family. What is the next thing that you need to do? When you say, this is our new direction, here's the question, what do I do next? Dads, moms, grandmas, granddads, what do you need to do? What is the next thing? Put that in your mind, and right then, that's your mission for your family. The change that needs to take place. And some of you need to back up off of all the stuff of life. And you need to say, what do we actually emphasize around here? What is really important here in our home? Tracy and I are new empty nesters. I don't even know. Like, we, we always have way too much food at our house now. So you want to figure out how you cook. Like, just plus one child, we wouldn't have enough. They eat a lot, and we didn't know how much they ate. But now it's just us. And you know what we have to do? We have to revision our future and where God is taking us. And we have to continually go back to the beginning. We have to say, okay, our objective was to raise, our goal was to raise adult followers of Christ. Now I've got adults. How do I continue to spur on their following of Christ when I'm in mission control rather than on the rocket with them? How do I do that? How do I turn my attention to these young people and say, how do we see and cultivate and steward you to be adult followers of Christ? But at all times, we have in our mind this goal of raising adult followers of Christ. And when we do that, when we do that, then the particulars begin to make more sense. So, what's the next thing? 
I want you to stand. The team's going to return. We're going to have a moment of prayer and a, a moment of commitment. Our moment of commitment this morning is really simple. It's just the answer to this question. What's the thing we need to do to cultivate that heritage in our home, in our church? How do we get focused on raising adult followers of Jesus? What needs to be said and what needs to be done? And today is the day for that decision. Will you pray with me? My Father, we ask for that moment of clarity that comes through your Holy Spirit. Where we have that one thing before us. Lord, for some of us, that one thing is repentance and confession. Our family needs to know that we understand. Lord, um, for some of us, it's salvation. We've never trusted You. Lord, for some of us, we're going to have to lay down some guilt for all that we weren't and everything we didn't do. Lord, so that we might take this next step. Lord, whatever it is, I ask that this would be a morning of renewal. Lord, as a church, we need to commit ourselves to participate in the raising of adult followers of Christ, to come alongside families, to love one another, and to love one another's kids. Lord, You've given us abundantly of children and students, and Lord, we ask that we would do right by them, and we would be a church where Your Spirit is present each week where you connect us to each other each day, where our kids see a vibrant, healthy, real faith. We'll do a work in us. We ask this in Jesus' name. This morning, we're not going to be here waiting for you. We're available to pray with you, but this altar is open. Maybe you need to just come here this morning, and you need to say to the Lord, this is the thing we're doing next. This altar is open to you as you sing. You come. I cast my mind to Calvary for Jesus' prayer. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior.
thank you for being here this morning. Um, I don't know if you got your worship card on the way in, but uh, you can get one on the way out. There it has some ways you can scan in. If you're our guest today, we'd love to say hi to you, and scanning that Connect card is a perfect way. There's many things happening, as I mentioned, as we reboot for this uh, new year, and, uh, or new ministry year, really beginning in August and September. And so you can scan in that this week, and it will take you to the Church Center app. If you don't have the Church Center app, this is a good place to start. All right, It will give you all the information, and when you say, how do I register, and all of that stuff, and how do I give, the easiest way to give is through the app. Uh, we do have some boxes for those of you who still write checks. We love you, and we love your checks, but nonetheless, um, it is safer and easier for you in the app. So I want to remind you some of what your giving does. Number one, we're not sweating that much in here, so your giving helps in some fundamental ways uh, to protect us from 108 outside. Is that Well, it's only 96 right now. Sorry. It'll be 108. Um, it also allows us to do Awana and our student ministry and our men's and women's work and uh, all the Bible study stuff and the missions that we have. Our London team is back. They went and helped Ryan and Amanda, and your giving helps us uh, send them to places that are unreached. I know London, they basically gave us our heritage, but London is now unreached and an unreached group of people, and so we have an important role there and internationally. It also helps us reach our neighbors. I don't know if you've been driving around lately, but if you were north coming in, you passed a bunch of new houses. There are 25 uh, new uh, form boards going up, houses going up in this division. There's another 50 or more being built down in Alvarado. There's a bunch on the way and everywhere in between all along this uh, Renfro corridor. And those are new people to town who need a church and more than that need salvation in Jesus. And uh, so we need to do the work. And when you give, it helps us to do what needs to happen. So let me encourage you, if you're not sure how to give, uh, we have that QR here. You just take out, some of you don't know this, I know, you just take out your camera. If you don't know how to get to your camera, I don't know what to say, but take out your camera. Usually you just hold it over, you click on it, it will take you where you need to go, straight to the giving portal. You can set up to give that way. That's a perfect way to participate. I don't have to tell you, we've struggled financially as a church as we've pursued solvency. Um, and the Lord has done some great things to help us get there. I believe we're on that route and we have a healthy future, but we're going to talk more about this uh, next Sunday night all right, when we have our ministry meeting, get you some reports and some information, and then also have a time just to talk a little more casually about the follow-up our, of our 40 days of prayer. But it is your gifts and your participation that drive the financial side of this effort. And so don't neglect to worship in your giving uh, and to give to the Lord, all right? Thank you. If you're our guest, see Tracy and I. We'll be right through that door at the welcome desk. We'd love to say hi to you. If you've got any questions, we can answer them there. But more than that, we just want to shake your hand and greet you to worship with us here today. Let's pray, and we'll be dismissed. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this. Uh, this day, we thank you for the call to be effective parents, Lord, to build as a church a heritage of faith for our families and for ourselves, Lord, to see the work of Christ continue for generations, and that is your desire and your plan. Lord, we ask that we would faithfully do that as a congregation. Lord, I ask that you'd provide for everything we need to do. Lord, that you would provide for our spiritual growth and development. You would help us to grow in Jesus. And Lord, I ask a blessing on each one who's here. That you would transform lives and turn them toward Christ. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.